can't be sure when this was done. But how remarkable to think of using Shiva Lingas on an Islamic gravestones. All this tells us something about transitional culture. Now, what really, you know, sorry? How do you know, how, what, what tells you that this is a Muslim grave? Because Hindus aren't buried. Similar question though, what tells you that it's a Shiva Linga because it doesn't bear very much resemblance to any of the icon iconographic? It's quite a simple mark. This shape with the rounded top, I mean, it's both of them. Understand? Yeah, yeah. Understand? I can't get those. Okay, it may be the slide. I, I mean, my eyes, because I can't really. I, is, is there an indentation there? Oh, okay. 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 Okay is uh, the, the Deshe Wadmana, used to be called Margaret Photographer, written in 1365. Now, that's written in Old Javanese, it's the great account of his kingdom at its height. So 1365 that's written, the first of these graves begins 1368. We believe these are the graves of Javanese aristocrats. The Deshe Wadmana describes the religious life of the kingdom, among other things, about how the king is Vishnu to the Vaishnavites, and, and Shiva to the Vishayavites. So you can have a survey of the religious cults of the kingdom. There's no mention of Islam. No Muslim, as far as he's concerned. So this suggests to me there are some people getting buried here who you know, regard themselves as Japanese Muslims. Meanwhile, this Buddhist writer at the court sees them as somehow beyond, beyond the society. It doesn't even mention them. But indubitably, they must have been in that court. Everything's doubtful at this period. But almost surely, there are Muslim aristocrats in the court. And he writes this great book in 1565 completely ignores their presence. Now there are other graves in each job that were various on certain dates, some in the 14th century. There's a bunch of graves, by the way, in Kadiri, which are undated, but very likely probably not graves. Um, and they look interesting. So we're beginning now to get pretty we're pretty confident we're seeing not just Islam present, but local Muslim conversions and probably aristocrats. We get the same thing when we move back to Aceh, there's a place called Minya Tuchu where we find the gravestone of a queen, or there's a problem. The name is missing. Then it says, Bint al-Sultan al marhum Malik Asari. The problem is there are two inscriptions on the stone. One has a date of 1389, and the other one has a date of 1380 in the common era. But the day, the day of the week, the day of the month, everything else is exactly the same. So we presume something got one numeral wrong. There's actually two inscriptions referring to the same woman dying, the daughter of the Sultan. Now the important thing about this is one of the texts is in Old Malay using local characters, the Paleo Sumatran script, and the other is in Arabic using Arabic script. So again, evidence of a gravestone in two languages indicating a stage of cultural transition, and I think one could be reasonably confident that it's probably a local Muslim. Otherwise why have why have the Paleo Sumatran script in the other language? So now we are getting along into the 1380s, and reasonably confident we are seeing indigenous Muslims in East Java, indigenous Muslims in North Sumatra. There's a series of graves which follow on in Samudra and elsewhere, which, um, uh, which confirm the presence of, um, uh, of further Muslims in the North. Um, it's interesting, actually, there's one guy who's buried there who was um, uh, died eight. 1406 died in Samudra. But he was actually a prince of the Abbasid dynasty. So a Middle Eastern prince, the Abbasid, was traveling through Southeast Asia, died in Samudra in 1406. Ibn Battuta had met his father at Port of Delhi in India. We're beginning to see the networks coming together, the vast international network, traveling Muslims and Southeast Asians. Now, we then get a very important. Have you actually seen this, by the way? Let me get a very important character. That's a bit better. Called Kawa. Kawa, a Chinese Muslim, uh, who wrote accounts of the voyages of the great Chinese admiral Jing Ha in the early 15th century. When the only time in history the Chinese decided they wanted to travel, oh, oh, the Chinese government decided to travel overseas. 
to describe the world. You've seen this book, 14, what is it, 14, mm -hmm. like six, or whatever it is, by, uh, what's his name? The guy who wrote the book about Chinese discovery in Europe, all the magazine. It's, it's a complete fraud. Yes. Yeah, in case you have any doubts, it's a complete fraud. It's in your name. He's made a lot of money out of it. Right? The rest of us write serious history and make no money. He made a fortune. He's made a fortune by writing books. Anyway, uh, Ma Huan went to Java in 1416. And now he presents us with a problem. He says there are three kinds of people in Java. There are Muslims who come from the West. There are Chinese, some of them are Muslim. And there are Javanese, there are savages who believe in devils. Now, now this is half a century after we've got the gravestones from East Java. So it's half a century after we have Ephmatified the Muslim. What does this tell us? I think there are two possible explanations.